inflation, which is, by the way, the ultimate tax in the world with people that don't realize it. But it will, of course, it'll increase the, you know, the value of certain assets, et cetera, et cetera, which erodes away the natural capital of the debt. So that is the basis for a lot of people going with interest only mortgages because actually the central bank. You found the Real Estate Law Podcast because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Law Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jason Muth, and we are here with an international guest this week, all the way from the UK. We're going to hear what's happening in the property and real estate scene in the United Kingdom. We are really eager to hear that because we have not had any guests on, Rory, from the United Kingdom just yet. We've had guests from Canada, so Rob will not be our first international guest, but I can't wait to hear how the what we're seeing here in the United States is similar to what Rob is seeing in the UK. So let me welcome Rory, actually, our co-host, Rory from Next Home Title Town Real Estate and Urban Village Legal in Boston. Hi, hey, Jason. I'm excited for this conversation, not only to broaden our scope geographically, but also investment strategies. I think Rob has an interesting story with the work that he's done in that space. So um, I'm happy to hear all of that too. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. So we should introduce our guest. It's Rob Smallbone or Robert Smallbone is more proper. He is an author. He is a real estate podcast host himself. He has the Property Nomads podcast, which is actually all about real estate and travel, two of his passions. And he is an author. You could buy his books on Amazon. Uh, he just released a brand new book called Property FAQs, Answers to Frequently Asked Property Questions. I'm sure some of that pertains to the United States as well. He also has a couple of the books on there, 50 No Nonsense Ways to Increase Your Sales Today and Buy to Let, How to Get Started. And because we are smart and international, we know that let means rent. Correct, Rory? Of course, yes. Ra, welcome to the podcast. Jason, Rory, thank you very much. And uh, no pressure representing uh, the United Kingdom uh, on today's episode. The entire kingdom. And we've been to the United Kingdom multiple times, multiple outposts of the kingdom as well. I first have to say, I apologize for having my shirt match the microphone cover. I did not expect that I'd be wearing the same exact blue, but here we are. Rob, I kind of wish we hit record on the on the Zoom, which we were using to record this before we did, because we had some lovely chatter about such awesome topics as uh, Liverpool FC and the New York Jets. Goodness, did you find your way to being the one fan of the New York Jets? Yeah, uh, great question. So, in a nutshell, I when I went to university in two thousand six, um, I played at guard position. I mean, I'll our quality of, of university football is nothing in comparison to college football, of course. So completely different game as such. Played guard for a little bit. And as a result of that, you know, every Sunday you go down the pub and watch Red Zone as we do. And, um, you know, people are sort of, you know, who's your team? I had no idea. But New York was the first place I went to in, in the USA. Uh, I was in a sports shop. I was with my brother and I saw some blue jerseys, saw some green jerseys. And I went, ah, I quite like the look at the green ones, picked up a jersey. It had a guy called Revis on the back. No idea who he was, but that sounds mm-hmm. all right. And, and bought the shirt. And of course, uh, Darrell Revis, Revis Island. And there you are. So it could have been anyone. Uh, it could have been the Giants, but it ended up being the Jets. Well, green is the color of US money as well. So maybe that's something that has to do with that. But boy, the Jets have had a tough run in basically their history <laughs> ever since Joe Namath. And I grew up outside New York City. I grew up in a Giants family. Uh, we had tickets for the New York Giants, uh, a Giants stadium, which is now MetLife Stadium. In the tri state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you were either a Giants fan or a Jets fan, but you're kind of not both. And then we ended up, I ended up moving to New England, and I've been a Patriots fan since the early, since the mid 90s. You know, when I was in college, I know you're nodding your head right there. Um, I did not jump the bandwagon when I came to Boston because I was a fan of the Pats beforehand. So I've just been circling the wagon of the Jets between the Giants and the the Patriots. And hey, at least last year, the Patriots didn't do as well. So the Jets had a little bit more of a shot. But one thing I've taken away, and it's actually quite pertinent to all business models. So people that are listening and thinking, oh, God, it's like 40 minutes of football. Uh, no, it's not. If you look at the Jets, 
head office, front office for the last, I don't know, before Joe Douglas, pretty much run like a horror show. No strategy, no organisation. Well, if there was organisation, it was very bad. No direction. And what the owners have done, whether it's Woody Johnson or his brother, whomever, they've brought in Joe Douglas, got a good track record. He's brought in coach Salah as well. And for the first time in, I think, my tenure of supporting them, we had a competent draft on paper, which it is remarkable because we've now got this strategy and this philosophy of how we want to play football. And that, I think, reflects off the field. At the end of the day, you're not going to have a successful organisation if you're not run well off the field. And, you know, it's been painful being in the same division as New England. OK, yes, you know, they had the GOAT. Yes, Belichick is also the GOAT at coaching as far as I'm concerned. You know, they're, they're a well-oiled machine off the field. So if we can start replicating that, I'm not expecting miracles for the forthcoming season. Our schedule's a pain in the backside. If we play hardball, win five or six games, mm-hmm. that's an improvement. That bodes well. But I, yeah, what I've been thinking about it is off the field, it's been a bit of a horror show. But actually, we're starting, I think, to change that. But that, that applies to any business. If you're right off the field, you're going to be good on the field. And, you know, hopefully that will show this season. Rory, I'd expect nothing but excellent analysis from a guest from the United Kingdom for U.S. pro football. And well, we would not have heard that from a New York Jets fan had we interviewed them uh, because you've gone deep into their organization. Uh, just, just what I'm hearing for you, you kind of peel the layers back as to why there are problems, not just that there are problems, which actually is a great lesson for business. Um, but, you know, I'll just leave it at this. The, the great news about the New York Jets is after every season, um, they probably get together and say, well, there's nowhere to go but up. So, you know, <laughs> next year, <laughs> sure. it's always a new campaign. Yeah, and Jason, it's your turn to give us some analysis about Liverpool. Go. Yeah, I don't think I can give you a lick of analysis on Liverpool. Why don't we talk about some real estate or some property? So is property the word that's used more frequently in the United Kingdom? Or is, is real estate synonymous with that? Or, or are those two kind of different categories? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing, but it's property. If you're speaking to anyone in the UK, it, we always say property. You might get the very odd person that says real estate, but you know, 99 times out of 100, if, you, if you're talking UK, you're talking the property market. Um, so that's probably, it's the same thing, effectively, just different words. Before we launch into the sports podcast, what was your genesis of um, interest in property? What brought you into property investing? Good question. So my business partner and I, we, we met at university in 2006. Yeah, just chilled out, didn't really do, you know, as you would do at university, involves uh, a lot of alcohol. Point being, uh, we've traveled a lot since then uh, together and we were on a trip in 2014, 2015, and we were, you know, long bus journeys equals a lot of time to talk. And we were just saying that actually it'd be good to be able to continue to travel, but not have to go back and work, uh, as in get into the habit of work for a few years, save up, you know, rinse and repeat the process. And for all the asset classes that we knew about at the time, um, we decided that, you know, property, for your listeners, I'm just going to call it property. Hopefully that doesn't confuse people too much. We just decided that property would actually be the best thing to do because the end goal, and it still is the goal, is is long-term wealth generation. And that doesn't happen overnight, as you know. So, yeah, we made that decision in 2015 and set up the company at Devoy and Smallboat Properties, which is our yeah, purchasing company. And we set that up in 2016 and um, yeah, just started started purchasing some property. So that's how it started. What type of property have you found your way toward as you know the asset class that you prefer? So it's what we would call buy to let. So your, your typical single family rental units. Yeah, mostly most of our stocks mid terrace homes so you get the really old rows of homes that you might be familiar with on photos so we normally have mid-terraced homes a reason for that is actually it's just that wasn't planned it's just that that's just how the portfolio looks and we do that in in the north of england uh, traditionally in the north of england so you're talking you know anywhere from liverpool to manchester to hull to newcastle those sorts of places uh, the the yield that you get, the return you get is pretty decent. So your cash flow is good. Mm-hmm. And most people that invest in into UK property will go to the north of England uh, because they're after the cash flow. So I say we're no different from that point of view. That's what a lot of the portfolio looks like at the moment. There's always going to be demand for housing. 
certainly in my lifetime there, there will be and we're not producing enough so the, the simple economics of them working in our favor you know if you're based in um brighton and you're on the road traveling quite a bit how do you manage all those properties that are um you know pretty far from you so I will point out that I've only recently moved back to Brighton. I actually was living in Hull, uh, Kingston upon Hull, for four and a half years, which is where most of the portfolio was. Circumstances at the time allowed me to move. Rent's much cheaper up there, so I, I, I moved myself. Mm-hmm. And that was a good experience. In terms of management, lettings agents. Um, you know, I'm always a, a fan of... You know, you can get we call it you know, landlords that manage themselves, and that that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But the way that Aaron and I think about it, we're thinking of, you know, when we're out and about on the road, and if we want to be, you know, traveling, be location independent as such, you might as well uh, invest in the lettings agents. That they're professionals at what they do. They're very good at what they do, as long as you find the right one, and you know, they can get rid of a lot of hassle for you, and it's. To us, it's well worth the investment. Did you ever start uh, as your own letting agent or property manager, and then you passed it over to various ones in the cities and towns where you're investing? Or was your business model always to have a letting agent as part of your budget? The latter. It was always to have a letting agent as, as part of the budget. We just, again, we always say start with the end in mind and you know, try and keep things as simple as, as possible. It's not always the case, but you know, if you can try and keep things as simple as possible and have that end goal, you know, nine times out of 10, it will, it will all go smoothly. What are the typical fees in the UK for a letting agent? Are they 10, 15, 20% of rents or how, how is that calculated? Uh, so well, it depends on the agent. I would say the average for what we do is, is 10%. Um, mm. Some agents will include VAT, value-added tax, and that's at 20% at the moment. The agents that we use don't do that. So if someone's paying £500 in in rent, then you can expect the management fee to be £50. Right. Rory, a lot of what Rob just mentioned sounds very similar to what we have here in the United States, where you know, he's focusing on communities that generate cash flow. So, mm-hmm. you know, very similar to here in the U.S., where a lot of people will focus more on the Midwest or the Sun Belt, places like Arizona, Florida, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan. Um, the coasts are, are diff- can be difficult to get cash flow in some situations, but it's not impossible. Um, people here focus on having a rental property management company as part of their budget, and they should. Mm-hmm. I'm curious what the where they diverge. In fact, how UK strategy might diverge from the strategy in the US. Mortgages, how do you guys calculate mortgage interest and whatnot? Good question. We're, we're, this might sound quite lazy, but we always we, we always hand out as many tasks as we can to professional people. So, you know, mortgage broker, for example, we deal with that. I can say is that when, when, when I say we start with the end in mind, we know that you guys know as well, and people listen to this, you're going to make your money when you buy, nine times out of 10. You might, of course, add value and you know increase the value of, of the property or, or the real estate. But normally, you make your money when you buy. And if you're getting it at a good price or you've added enough value, again, our philosophy is we'll go on to interest-only mortgages. We're not interested in paying down the capital. Why? Because we're looking at a very, very, very long-term view. And... Mm. I say, you know, inflation, normally they like to do it at about 2%. Um, of course, at the time this comes out, it's nothing like that, but in, in mm-hmm. you know, regular economic times as such. Um, so, you know, inflation is going to erode erode away the cost of the natural debt. So it makes sense to have it on interest only. So, again, basic economics, in my opinion. And yeah, hopefully that answers the question. I, I don't think that the strategies would divulge in a different way. Uh, it really all comes down to fundamentals. So, you know, if you're investing in an area, say, say, for example, in the Midwest, or I'll take any city, I'm just going to say Newcastle uh, over here, you know, this is the sort of thing we'd look for is where is the demand? Of course, you're going to have some areas that are going to be good and some areas that are going to be not so good. 
what are the fundamentals? Are there schools? Are there hospitals? What's transport like? What are people after? And you can do a lot of that homework on the phone, ringing estate agents or realtors, I think you call them, ring lettings agents. You can do a lot of that on the phone, uh, plus Google Maps as well. It will give you a good idea. So I don't think the fundamentals, I think, of property are always are going to be there. I think no matter what, to an extent, depending on the legal system, it, it shouldn't matter what country you do it in, the fundamentals will be there. Of course, I understand with ideologies around the world that it's easier said than done. But we're talking US, UK, I'm going to say they're going to be very, very similar. And a lot of that's down to, you know, going to be down to legal systems and the bits and bobs like that. I do think it's fascinating to hear the similarities between both countries' property, real estate, investing systems and strategy. Uh, You know, I think that a lot of folks in the U.S. might think that things are unique here, but everything you've said is, you know, the same fundamentals that we look at when we make our own investments. Rory, a lot of your clients would probably listen to everything Rob just said and say, yep, that's exactly what we do, wouldn't they? Absolutely. It's, um, you know, among states, among countries, as long as you're kind of speaking in the greater, you know, capitalist world, the the strategies are the same. The the regional differences are are largely the same. If you're looking for an area that generates cash flow versus appreciation, all that's among the same. You're just looking on the edges with, um, you know, in some countries they have VAT, we don't have VAT, but th- those things are kind of on the edges. Um, you know, what the, the tax strategies and the deadlines are, that's all, that's all on the edges. But, you know, I want to focus on something you said, and that is starting with kind of the end in mind in your business model, but kind of taking it up a level, the purpose you had, you started with the end in mind, and that is you want to to free up a lifestyle where you can travel a little bit more. You're not tied down. You're a bit freer. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know that as a motivation for your your property investing? Yeah, absolutely. So probably be able to speak on behalf of Aaron and myself here because we've got very similar values, very similar end goals, and the idea is to be able to have a reliable stream of income or streams of income, obviously with books and whatnot you get a little bit you know a few dollars a month from them as well which is nice we always said the same thing at some point you know life life is life things things will happen um you know for example my fiance is mexican we're going to get married uh, next year and you know that creates a whole new raft of experiences and challenges at the same time which is great i'm looking forward to it but in terms of the travel it's just that that sense of freedom you know to the best example I can give, that, and again, I don't know whether what it's been like in, in the US, um, but in the summer over here, there's been a lot of issues with flights, um, with various companies. A lot of flights have been cancelled, short haul, like you name it. It's all been cancelled because of various BS that you know the companies are given, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I look at summer flying, a lot of it's going to be people that have been pent up for the last few years that are desperate for a holiday. In our case, it's, you know, I say in our case, from an English point of view, it's let's go off to Spain, let's go and get some sun, blah, 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 blah. But when it comes down to travel, I know that Aaron well, is in June at some point, just, you know, he went off to Madeira, which is a tiny set of islands um, off the African coast, but they're Portuguese. It's, he was out, it was out of school time. No issues. He had no issues flying. Um, I was in Mexico at the start of the year. I was there for two months. No issues at the airport because you're going in whatever time suits you. So it's just the tiny things like that can make a biggest difference. Um, yeah, you're not relying on other people to say, well, you can have a holiday or well, you can just, you know, as long as you've got the plans in place, mm-hmm. you can just go. And, and that provides, in, in, my, in my opinion, that provides a bit of freedom uh, to be able to make those decisions. That for us, is important. Hopefully that answers the question. Is there anything else you want me to touch upon there, Rory? No, it does. I mean, in here that, you know, let's just take away just, you know, for you, you know, travel is associated with freedom, you know, whatever other people's goals are, that's their freedom in investing so that they can free up and make decisions for themselves that they're not necessarily tied down to a location of an employer. Um, They have the the freedom to to go. And that's where these cash flowing um, property investments, I think are, are wonderful for a large set of our audience. The travel issues that you have described are also happening here in the United States. I literally just read an article to Rory yesterday as we were driving. I have to read this to you right now. So it was our it was our conversation about it was a perspective from an airline, a flight attendant, about you know some things that can be done 
with the summer travel crisis. Basically, the airlines, they had a lot of people that took early retirement. They laid a lot of people off a couple of years ago. They were not able to restaff accordingly. And the travel, mm-hmm. the volume is higher than it was pre-pandemic. So a lot of the cancellations are because they don't have crews. And they're just offering people tons of money left and right to step off planes, uh, you know, because they're all full flights and everyone's nerves are uh, at an 11 on a 1 to 10 scale. So yeah, it's a very different travel environment from back in the day when I used to be a consultant. I was on the road consistently traveling and it was a lot more enjoyable. But to your point about time, you know, if you don't have to worry too much about that because you're not stuck in a W-2 job that you don't like with your two weeks vacation, maybe three weeks that you get in the US. I know in Europe, vacation is a little bit more, it's given out a little more freely, I believe. People have longer periods of time off. But you know, if you have your your time back because you're creating your own cash flow and your own schedule, you know, that is the end game. And real estate and property just happens to be the way to get there. I do have a question related to something that you mentioned about five or 10 minutes ago that I want to ask about uh, the book you just put out. You mentioned interest-only loans. Roy, we don't have much of that anymore in the US, right? Unless I'm totally missing something. We had it 10, 12 years ago, back when there was a latter part of the last decade or two decades ago. It's, some of those loan products are starting to reemerge, but the financial markets here were so skittish after the 2008, 2009 yeah. um, real estate meltdown because they were putting out loans that completely unsustainable and it brought down the economy and pretty quick order. So things like interest only loans have been frowned upon even with among commercial investors. Um, but with rates rising and the regulations easing a touch, those products are coming back, but they're still relatively rare. Even if you compare the US to Canada, they're relatively rare here. But Rob, are those common in the UK? I just want to sort of fire back before I answer that question. Um, I also read an article about, I think it was Delta Airlines offering $10,000 for flights. If that was me, I'd have taken it and bought gold. Yeah. I'd have been great. Thanks. See you later. I'll, I'll have a yeah. bit of that. Thank you. Just genius. Um, yeah, similar similar things here though with British Airways are the same, same thing. Yeah, I'd say interest only mortgage rates normally sparks a lot of debate over here because you've got two ways of looking at it. You've got the, the point that I mentioned earlier on that you know inflation, which is by the way the ultimate tax in the world with people that don't realize it but it will of course it'll increase the you know the value of certain assets etc cetera, etc cetera, which erodes away the natural capital of the debt so that is the basis for a lot of people going with interest only mortgages because actually the central banks the governments and they're all going to do it for you, you you know even if you don't realize it at the time then you've got the more traditional mortgages, which we would call capital and repayment, or is it repayment interest, whatever they're called, is where you pay, obviously, the, you start paying the capital back as well as a bit of the interest. And after, you know, 30 years or whatever it is, that there is no, you know, debt on that, that property as such. Difference between the two is that if you go with the capital and repayment mortgage, the amount that you pay on the mortgage per month is normally a lot higher than the interest only. So if you're getting into property for cash flow point of view, you could you could easily erode that cash flow straight away, mm-hmm. which defeats the object. But some investors that I know prefer to do that because in 20, 30 years time, they, you know, they don't want the hassle of dealing with mortgage companies. And, you know, there have been sometimes in the last few, not just few years, you know, I've said the same to Aaron, you know, when I'd love, part of me knows it doesn't make the most financial sense. But I'd love to be able to pay off all the mortgage companies. If I never have to speak to a mortgage company again, my life would be a lot easier. It seems, I don't know what it's like over there, but it always seems, it's just making up rules as they go along. Mm-hmm. We had one, I won't name names, we had one the other day uh, refinancing a property over here. And we had one the other day, and they looked at our gearing, they looked at our gearing on our portfolio, and they got the numbers wrong. And you're the bank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's scary if you ask me. But they're the main differences. And... It depends who you speak to. It depends again. It it depends. You know, what what's the end goal? If you want to, in thirty years time, have a bunch of property that's got no mortgage debt, anything like that, then you'll you'll want to pay it off. If you're not too fussed about that because you have a grasp of the economics in the long term, you're probably going to go with interest only. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, speak personally also, our portfolio, you know, most all of ours are principal and interest loans, uh, which is what we'd call it here in the US. I don't think I was aware that interest only was back and something that we could do. We might look at that also. I do understand that would actually increase cash flow because it brings your your monthly payment down. We do have uh, a strategy here where people might take out a, a 30-year fixed loan and then they will pay extra every month uh, and basically amortize it over 20 or 15 years, you know, to pay it down quicker. But you know, the flip side of that, a lot of the property growth and a lot of the investing strategy you hear from US investors is to leverage. So, you know, uh-huh. you want a lower payment and you want to be able to pull money out of properties as much as you can through refinancing or home equity lines of credit or home equity loans. So, you know, too much capital is not wrapped up in in one particular property. So some of those strategies are similar. I bet you if there were interest only loans available here in the US more readily, I bet we would actually see more investors looking toward those. I know that people are looking more at adjustable rate mortgages now that interest rates have gone up, especially if it's like a 7-1 arm, you know, and you're only going to keep the property or refinance it within 7 years if you can get a good rate on that arm you might take that out instead of a 30-year fixed loan. But yeah, that's interesting to hear that you guys have that as an option. But I mean, is this question about leveraging is it comes down to what is your end goal. So as an investor, are you are you trying to create the most secure retirement that you can and and you want the peace of mind knowing that you don't have the outstanding debt and the debt obligations, um, then you may want to pay down the principal as quickly as possible. Um, if you are you know, banking on the appreciation that may alter your goals. Um, but if you're looking for the max amount of cash flow now, particularly if you're younger, I can see a, a compelling case to um, to either extend the amortization or to limit itself to interest only if the deal is right. I'll try and tackle that because uh, you raised a couple of really good points, there, Rory. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Jason, as well. Um, yeah, start with the end in mind. I, I would say that if you're going to get into property in the hope that property prices will increase, then you're barking up the wrong tree. You, you know, you need to do some proper homework if you're going to get in there and hope that it goes up. It's not always the case. So that's the first thing I'd say to that. Secondly, if you look at the history of, of how spread, again, certainly in this country, probably, I guess, around most of the world, because of the fact that inflation has been around for a very, 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 very long time, the actual asset prices have been steadily, in general, increasing. Of course, it, it can go up and down, so let's not put anyone under any disillusions. The overarching debt in the long run doesn't concern me purely because as far as I'm concerned, if as long as the cash flow is there, that's the most important thing to us. The property could be worth one million pounds. It could be worth a pound. If it's cash flows at 500 pounds a month, I, I don't really care what the asset value is, to be perfectly honest with you, because I'm looking at I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at the cash flow. If I was doing the other strategy, which is your cap at appreciation, yeah, absolutely. I'd be very concerned. But from a cash flow point of view, it doesn't bother me if, it, if the asset's worth a million pounds or a pound. If it provides cash flow, that's the key thing as well. So that's the point I was trying to make. Kind of push back just with our portfolio on a, in a sense where the capital appreciation has really mattered for properties. We have no intention of selling because they do generate cash flow over time. But that added capital appreciation has unlocked extra equity, which we can in turn tap to turn around as down payments for more property and it creates more leveraged opportunities for us to, to grow our portfolio from there. So, in a lot of those cases, you know, in the past few years, a lot of that, that appreciation is false in the sense that it's just the effect of inflation, but that capital appreciation has unlocked opportunities for us to leverage things quite a bit more. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Uh, I think the point I was trying to make, if you go into investing in, in property and you're doing it in the hope that it goes up, then you've got to reconsider why you're doing it. Don't ever base an investment decision on hope. I think that was the point I was trying to make. You know, yes. and you guys have got a great example there of how um, the increase in your portfolio has led to more opportunities, which, you know, is is obviously great in this, but it's part of the joys of property investing. Can see that that agree completely with that point that, you know, parking money and try, you know, enduring loss, cash flow losses are just, you know, breaking even cash flow wise and the hopes of something's going to appreciation is a, Mm -hmm. is a dangerous proposition. Um, It's almost a gamble. And to your point, Rob, hope is not a strategy, (laughs) is it? (laughs) Uh, We've heard that lots of times. 
Let's talk about your book that you just published a few months ago, Property FAQs, Answers to Frequently Asked Property Questions. I know that financing is uh, one of those FAQs. What are some other uh, questions that you have fielded uh, over uh, the past couple of years or months of, of your speaking on your podcast and talking to people that are interested in real estate investing? We get, as you can imagine, Chris, when you're having really good conversations with people, you can get all sorts of all sorts of questions. Uh, the key, the key ones, or the ones that we've had from our networking, how do you get started? It's normally the biggest issue. I think that that's probably fair in most walks of life. Actually, it's okay talking a good game, but actually taking that first step, you know, can be challenging mentally. So that's a lot of a lot of things we get. It's actually, how do you get started? Uh, what you know over here. Uh, you know, what do you need to look for? So how do I know if an area is good? How do I know if it's not good? Uh, what, Where should I buy? Now, that's like the million dollar question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the answer is always, it depends. It depends on what you want, what you're looking for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what else has popped up? We, we get the odd finance question. I always say the same that we, especially in property FAQs, we've got a broker section at the back that was written by, uh, Mark Champ of Wolf Financial. We get on really well with Mark. He he knows his stuff. So there, there's some great questions and answers from a mortgage broker um, himself at the back there. If anyone ever asks us any financial questions, I normally give the same answer. You know, I'm not an independent financial advisor. Please don't actually uh, take anything I say as advice. Always speak to your professionals, whether that's a mortgage broker, tax accountant, accountant, whomever. But I'd say most of the questions are all around good areas and, and how you get started. It's worth checking out. I mean, those are all questions that uh, we hear as well. We just haven't written them down in a book format like you have. So congratulations for actually getting them all um, compiled for everyone to just be able to pick up and, and pick your brain. Uh, you know, where do you start is is a question that comes up all the time, you know, for any kind of real estate um, investors or meetups or people that we talk to that know that we're doing this and they want to get into it, but they don't know where to begin. Um, you know, it's a great question and there's lots of, and it's, it's like, um, we're doing this podcast probably for reasons like why you're doing yours. So people can tell the story about why they started and where they're headed. And, you know, I've said this many times in this podcast before that this is not a zero sum game. You know, we're all here to educate each other because you don't have to win and I lose. I don't have to win for you to lose. Like we could both win because we're learning together. And you know, the lessons that you're telling us in the United Kingdom are very, very similar to lessons here in the US. And that actually helps underline the points of like why these are good lessons to learn um, in forums like this. Let's talk about your podcast, uh, the Property Nomads podcast. You actually have an interesting flow of the episodes that you release that are um, alternating between travel and property. So how'd you come up with the idea for the podcast and, and what has that experience been like? Podcasting has been good fun, as you you know, you know guys can attest to. Really good. Definitely got a lot of lessons out of it. Uh, certainly, as with any podcast, if, if you listen back to your first episodes, you know, you've and compare them to the episodes that we all produce now, I think it's fair to say that most people would have improved significantly in, in podcast quality and, and content. Yeah, the, the the way that we have the podcast is that normally the main episode, which is a Monday, is normally property-based. It, sometimes it isn't, actually. Sometimes it could be chats with uh, other professionals that we've had. So again, tax accountants, uh, insurance, all that sort of stuff, whatever is interesting basically at the time and then the Thursday episodes have been travel um yeah that, that all came about because Aaron found all of our photos from 2014 2015 now in a nutshell we went to the uh, world cup FIFA world cup football oh sorry soccer world cup whatever you want to call it in Brazil so we flew out to Brazil we were there for we were in Rio de Janeiro for six weeks and we went around South America ended up in Mexico so we ended up in Central America. Uh, but we'd lost all the photos. Uh, obviously, phones have changed and, you know, that sort of stuff. But he, he found them on an old CD some a little while ago. So that prompted all the memories to come back. He said, oh, yeah, I remember doing that. Oh, this was here, that was there, and this happened. And I was like, do you know what? I might as well take, you know, a few days out. And I did this last summer. 
like, yeah, I'll take a few days out. I'll, I'll record it because now actually I can remember what happened. There's some great stories in there. So that's how the travel episodes came about. Um, at the moment, they're very reflective of things that we've done prior. Uh, sorry, previously. Um, I mean, that might change in due course. I mean, you know, who knows? But that, that's where we are at, at the moment. And as with yourselves, it's it's working with it's working with the listeners, working with you know people that love listening to the show. What do you like? What do you not like? Do you want actually? Do you want it all travel? Do you want it all property? And you know, people are happy with the blend at the moment. But again, audience engagement. We'll we'll see what happens, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. It's an interesting twist to a traditional real estate podcast that I'm sure that we all listen to. And you as a listener are probably listening to us along with many other real estate podcasts. You know, there's a long list of them and a lot of them are really good. And, you know, the fact that you've actually twisted some of your travel stories into yours, adds some good diversity into all the real estate lessons that you're telling. So uh, congratulations for finding your way down that pathway. And I hope that you've enjoyed recording the episodes that you have, because, you know, we certainly enjoy recording the Real Estate Law podcast. So why don't we get to our final questions? Uh, we'd love to hear how you can you know, wrap things up and answer the same three questions that everybody else that's been on this podcast has answered. And then we will tell, we'll let you tell everyone where they could find you if they want to reach out to you. We'll certainly put everything in the show notes as well. So question number one, really curious to hear your answer to this one, because this could be a lot of different things. <laughs> if you can get on stage for 30 minutes and talk about any subject in the world with zero preparation, what would that be? Oh. That's a good question. That's a very good question. I would we record that. I'd be I'd be inclined to talk about gold. To be honest, I think it's as you say, it could be anything. I'd be inclined to talk about gold. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that, to me, it seems that a lot of people around the world don't realise what's going on. And you know, gold has has been a very good servant to the world for what five thousand years plus. So it's been around for a long time, a lot of history. I think it's underloved, underappreciated as a, an asset class in itself. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably get up st- on stage and uh, chat about that, which would probably lead me to a mul- multitude of uh, subjects. But uh, yeah, gold is is my answer to that question. Hmm. Would, would silver be the counterpoint if you had to date <laughs> somebody? Yeah, absolutely. Silver, uh, copper, aluminium, zinc. I, mean, I don't know mm-hmm. as much about those, but... Yeah, you know, given the given the way that certain people in the world want the world to go, uh, if there ends up being a lot more solar panels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, they do require things like copper, silver, mm-hmm. zinc. So actually, it's quite a, quite an int- commodities in general, quite interesting to um, deep dive into. I was waiting for you to say the jets. <laughs> <laughs> But I had a feeling. I had a feeling you were hoping that was yeah, the answer. So I didn't hey, want to hear it. Hey, go, gold and commodities uh, will you know continue to showcase your intellect. You know the New York Jets. You could showcase your intellect, but then we would question your reasoning as to why you <laughs> picked them. But that's okay. Second question that we have is: Tell us something that happened early in your life or career that impacts the way that you're working today. If I think about our early, our early properties. So in, in terms of that, we made a lot of mistakes in, on the first couple of properties uh, in terms of refurbishments and a couple of external things like low valuations and, and things like that. And I think that those incidents helped to build up a lot more mental resolve and actually help us to understand that, you know, anything can happen. If someone has a bad day at the office and they're out valuing a home, that can have some serious consequences. So I think that and, and refurbing, we, we learned a lot from the first couple of properties. That's put us in good stead for future purchases. Yeah. People never make that first purchase and it's the best one. You know, you always learn learn from mistakes along the way and improve upon that. So one thing we said, we have short-term rentals, uh, which we've talked about a lot in this podcast. And you know, we encourage people for that first year to just kind of break even and just get your systems in place. You know, like don't expect to make a a ton that first year, you know, don't lose your shirt either, but you know, build your systems and then move Mm -hmm. from there. And then a couple of years later, you know, you're going to look back at that first year and say, I'm really glad that I, you know, didn't set a massively high expectation or goal because, you know, then, then you'll get disappointed. I mean, like, you know, cover your costs, get your systems in place and start making some money. Mm -hmm. I would just point, uh, just to cement that point, as probably heard the phrase, Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm-hmm. The, the, these things take time. The you know, property is not 
is not necessarily a get rich quick. You get wealthy slowly. And if you can, if you have that mentality and you go into it with that, you'll be absolutely fine. What a great soundbite. I got to tell the producer to isolate that one. <laughs> Our final question for you, Rob, is tell us something you're listening to, watching, or reading these days. I, uh, I've, I've got a bit addicted, I'd say, to Forged in Fire. I have no idea if you're familiar with that program at all. Yeah. Um, it basically, it's all, it's uh, metalworking, metallurgy, blacksmithing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an American program, actually. So it's, it's um, yeah, basically in a nutshell, you've got, you get four contestants, normally you get four contestants. Uh, they go into the forge on the forge floor. They've got three or four experts there that are going to put the swords and whatnot to the test. Mm -hmm. They normally have to create their own sword to start off with. Then they normally put a handle on it after a round of testing. And then the judges are testing. I mean, they're cutting antlers, cutting copper, all mm -hmm. of this sort of stuff. And then they have to create two people from that, then have to create, recreate um, you know, an iconic weapon from history. I've seen everything, Roman swords, you know, whatever. So I'm a bit addicted to that program at the moment. Uh, it's, it's good fun. It's it's interesting to watch. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning, I'm actually learning a lot about metallurgy and, and blacksmithing. Uh, I might have to go and have like an experience day in the UK and get behind a forge myself. So uh, that, that's what I'm watching at the moment. I know it's, you know, we've all got to have our own downtime and that could be whatever we want it to be. And uh, yeah, that, that program, I've got a bit of an addiction to that at the moment. I love how you tied your first and third answers together with elements. And uh, it looks like it's on the History Channel here in the US. I had never heard of it before. I'd recommend a couple of episodes. You know, it's, I just enjoy it. It's simple, it's simple watching. It's not, doesn't take up a lot of mental bandwidth. And uh, yeah. I've, always, I've always said to my business partners, because he's the one that got me into it. I said, if I can get in the phrase, a canister of Damascus into a conversation <laughs> at some point this year, I'll be loving it. I'll, you know, that'll be that. That'll be my year complete if I can fit that into a conversation. I think you just did. Yeah. Right, Rob. Uh, tell us where can people find you if they'd like to learn more about you, listen to your podcast, find your books. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, thanks, Jason. So you touched on it earlier on the books on Amazon. Uh, I would recommend. Uh, you are. I'd recommend them all, of course. Uh, but property FAQs. Um, there's another one mm -hmm. called 101 Top Property Tips. Uh, that was an amalgamation of, of people giving their best tips and we put it into a book. So I'd recommend that as well. And for those that are maybe that are European based that are listening, that are thinking about getting into the UK market, I'd recommend buy to let how to get started. That is very UK orientated. That book, uh, check us out on the Property Nomads podcast. We're the usual platform, Spotify, Stitch, uh, iTunes, that sort of stuff. I'll send over a link tree to put in the, the show notes that has everything on there as well. And any personal questions, I always say email me, rob at tpnpodcast.com. You can imagine quite uh, active. So I'll try and get back uh, to people where I can. Uh, but they'll be the best ways to find us. Awesome. Found that link tree actually prior to this episode. So we have all those links. We will put them all in the show notes so people can download, download episodes of the podcast, go buy the book, reach out to you, learn more about you and your business partner, all the work that you guys are doing. Rory, any final thoughts or... This is a great conversation. Um, listen to it and just kind of draw from it kind of the universal um, the universal things that we've been preaching for a while about um, how to get into real estate and how to make it work for you. Other than that, if people want to find me, um, I'm at my real estate brokerage, Next Home Title Town, nexthometitletown.com, or my law practice, Urban Village Legal, urbanvillagelegal.com. Rob, you'll have to let us know if you're ever in the New England uh, when the Jets are playing the Patriots. Hmm. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take you out to a pub in Boston and uh, show you some of the sites. It sounds good to me. I'll, I'll return the favour if you ever have to be in and around London. Uh, again, let me know and it'd be a, an honour to, again, have a couple of beers, go see some sport and show some of the sights. So uh, I'll return the favour. Awesome. Well, we love that. That's uh, that's very generous of you. Um, so that's it. That's a new uh, another episode of the Real Estate Law Podcast. Thank you for listening. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you have enjoyed it, uh, we'd love it if you can give us a great rating or you can give us a comment or you can reach out to me directly. Jason at nexthometitletown.com. Thumbs up, subscribe, all those things uh, help us uh, reach more and more listeners with great conversations like the one that we've just had. So um, on behalf of Rob, Rob, thank you. Rory, thank you. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. This has been the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures. And law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. We're powered by Next Home Title Town. 
Greater Boston's progressive real estate brokerage. More at nexthometitletown.com. And Urban Village Legal, Massachusetts Real Estate Council, serving savvy property owners, lenders, and investors. More at urbanvillagelegal.com. Today's conversation was not legal advice, but we hope you found it entertaining and informative. Discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.